Chapter 39 of The Holiest of All by Andrew Murray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christopher Smith. Chapter 39. The High Priest Learning Obedience. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 7 and 8. Who in the days of his flesh, having offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him out of death, and having been heard for his godly fear, though he was a son, yet learned obedience by the things which he suffered. We have already noticed with what persistence the writer has sought to impress upon us the intense reality of Christ's humanity, his being made like unto his brethren, his partaking of flesh and blood in like manner as ourselves, his being tempted in all things like as we are. In the opening verses of our chapter he has again set before us the true high priest, himself compassed with weaknesses. He now once more returns to the subject. In verse 6 he has already quoted the promise in regard to the order of Melchizedek as the text of his father teaching, but feels himself urged to interpose and, before repeating the quotation in verse 11, still more fully to unfold what the full meaning is of the blessed humiliation of the Son of God. He leads us in spirit down into Gethsemane and speaks of the wondrous mystery of the agony there as the last stage in the preparation and the perfecting of our high priest for the work he came to do. Let us enter this holy place with hearts bowed under a consciousness of our ignorance, but thirsting to know something more of the great mystery of godliness, the Son of God become flesh for us. Who in the days of his flesh? The word flesh points to human nature in the weakness which is the mark of its fallen state. When Jesus said to his disciples in that dark night, Watch and pray, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, he spoke from personal experience. He had felt that it was not enough to have a right purpose, but that, unless the weakness of the flesh were upheld, or rather overcome, by power received in prayer from above, that weakness would so easily enter into temptation and become sin. The days of his flesh, encompassed with its weaknesses, were to him a terrible reality. It was not to yield to this that he watched and prayed. Who in the days of his flesh, having offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him out of death, and having been heard for his godly fear, having gained the strength to surrender his will and fully accept the Father's will, and the renewed assurance that he would be saved and raised out of it, though he was a son, the form of the expression implies that no one would have expected from the Son of God what is now to be said, yet learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Gethsemane was the training school where our high priest, made like to us in all things, learnt his last and most difficult lesson of obedience through what he suffered. Though he was a son, as the Son of God come from heaven, one would say that there could be no thought of his learning obedience. But so real was his emptying himself of his life in glory, and so complete his entrance into all the conditions and likeness of our nature, that he did indeed need to learn obedience. This is of the very essence of the life of a reasonable creature, of man, that the life and the will he has received from God cannot be developed without the exercise of a self-determining power, without the voluntary giving up to God in all that he asks, even where it appears a sacrifice. The creature can only attain his perfection under a law of growth, of trial and of development, in the overcoming of what is contrary to God's will, and the assimilating of what that will reveals. Of Jesus it is written, The child grew and waxed strong, becoming full of wisdom. What is true of his childhood is true of his maturer years. At each stage of life he had to meet temptation and overcome it. Out of each victory he came with his will strengthened, and his power over the weakness of the flesh, and the danger of yielding to its desire for earthly good, or its fear of temporal evil, increased. In Gethsemane his trial and his obedience reached their consummation. 
He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Suffering is something unnatural, the fruit of sin. God has made us for joy. He created us not only with the capacity but the power of happiness, so that every breath and every healthy movement should be enjoyment. It is natural to us, it was so to the Son of God, to fear and flee suffering. In this desire there is nothing sinful. It only becomes sinful where God would have us submit and suffer, and we refuse. This was the temptation of the power of darkness in Gethsemane, for Jesus to refuse the cup. In his prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears, Jesus maintained his allegiance to God's will. In wrestlings and bloody sweat, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The deepest suffering taught him the highest lesson of obedience. When he had yielded his will and his life, his obedience was complete, and he himself was perfected for evermore. This is our high priest. He knows what the weakness of the flesh is. He knows what it costs to conquer it, and how little we are able to do it. He lives in heaven, able to succour us, sympathising with our weaknesses, bearing gently with the ignorant and erring, a high priest on the throne, that we may boldly draw nigh to find grace for timely help. He lives in heaven and in our heart to impart to us his own spirit of obedience, so that his priesthood may bring us into the full enjoyment of all he himself has and is. Heard for his godly fear how it becomes me then to pray in humble, holy reverence, that I may pray in his spirit, and be heard too for his godly fear. This was the very spirit of his prayer and obedience. He learned obedience through suffering. Learn to look upon and to welcome all suffering as God's message to teach obedience. He learned obedience. This was the path in which Christ was trained for his priesthood. This is the spirit and the power that fitted him for the throne of glory, the spirit and the power which alone can lift us there, the spirit and the power which our great high priest can impart to us. Obedience is of the very essence of salvation. Whether we look at Christ being perfected personally, or at the merit that gave his death its value and saving power, or at the work wrought in us, Obedience, the entrance into the will of God, is the very essence of salvation. He learned obedience. Jesus was obedience embodied, obedience incarnate. I have only as much of Jesus in me as I have of the spirit of obedience. End of chapter 39